<laughs> it wasn't obvious that we'd start. <laughs> uh, in the middle, Gary Cohen. Gary Cohen had had his heart for a good number of years. Unfortunately, passed away this past winter, or fall rather. But I've got to tell you something. He was still working into his 80s with that new heart. Went to the transplant games, participated in the sports there, and was truly an inspiration for us all. So, you know what? We're all going to die someday. May we live every day to its fullest as Jerry did. So, I proudly put his face up there. And then over on my right here, Steve wanted to stand up. Steve is our vice president, and he is also an inspiration. How many years now, Steve? Four. Four years, and donating his time for everything under the sun in any way he can to help others. So, with that, I just wanted to uh, introduce myself with the message, Live Life Every Day. That was me coming home 10 days after the heart transplant back in 1994, October 94. And in 98, this was the front page of USA Today newspaper. I was swimming at the transplant games, and doesn't that look great? <laughs> That's me trying not to drown. <laughs> and so may you live as many years as God permits and do it fully. And so that's me today. My wife Pam back there will introduce herself in just a minute, but she took that picture, so I gotta give her credit for it. It's copyrighted. <laughs> and so what I'd like to do is just introduce you, but we gotta do it in a different way. We've got so many, we got <coughs> of time. So let me ask, how many have had a transplant within the past 12 months? Stand up. Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. Stand up any caregivers are with any of these parts. They're very good. Congratulations to you. One, two, three years. Way to go. And the caregivers? Three to five years. Way to go. anybody might be coming because they're all busy doing something. I think <laughs> this picture, by the way, is from two, th two years ago at our Second Chance Dinner Dance. These are seven people of about 20 that came out to dinner dance that are out beyond 20 years. Look at the names underneath and you'll see 23 years. Now, you know, that just seems like a number. And if I say I'm going on 18, you say 23, that's pretty close. It's not close at all. These people were transplanted back in the 80s. And let me tell you something. The cardiac surgeons of the day, if they're being honest with you, will say, we didn't know what we were doing. We were trying things, and when it worked, we did more of it. When it didn't work, we stopped doing that. And so when you can meet somebody that's out more than 20 years, uh, that's a, a aha moment, okay? Very special. Come to our dinner dance, April, Steve? May, May 4th. May 4th, over in New Jersey. Come meet some of these people, okay? And so uh, there are secrets to the long life. And Lee is going to talk about the health and treatment part of it. But let me just repeat something I said back in October real quick. All right? The secrets of a long life, these people would tell you. One, compliance. All right? You all know Donna over here with all she's done responsibly so broad. But the medications, you know, you're going to hear stories out there about how some people are getting off medication. They're not heart patients. They're liver patients. Don't mix it up. Okay? Keep with the medication. I don't care how good you feel. That's the first secret. Second, follow through on your appointments here, whatever it is. The team does a great job. They don't want to lose any one of you. They got a lot invested in you. When they say go see this other doctor because some results of the test, go see them. Great teams here. Second, get active and involved. Hang back. There's second chance. 
We'll talk a little bit more about that later. The like donor program across the town has plenty of opportunities for volunteerism. Uh, Transplant Recipients International, United Network of Organ Sharing, both organizations that invite participation and make a big difference in the world of transplant. So if you're up to doing that, come see me and <coughs> more about it. Basically, find your passion, whatever it is. You know, if you're retired and you're sitting back, uh-uh, not going to help that part a bit. Find out what your passion is, go do it, and network with those who are successful. And that's what you're doing out here today. Second Chance has in its membership, and to be a member, you have to be our transmit recipient. Okay? It's a local organization. Okay? Over 800 members. Or a caregiver. I'm sorry? Or a caregiver. Or a caregiver. But the 800 are heart transplant patients. Recipients, rather. Those are patients once you get them. <laughs> and so with over 800 local, I knew you were a couple. you're part of a very exclusive, very successful as as club. Did. Just today, we were talking oh, about turn it on? what's life expectancy after a transplant. You use the figures from back in the 80s till today, it's somewhere in the range of 9 to 10 years. If you use those who are getting transplanted recently, like that past, last 5 or 10 years, doctors are now saying it's a normal lifespan. Isn't that amazing? So think that, live that, and thank you for coming out with something like this and learning more about this. And by all means, give thanks to your donor. This is my donor, Roberto. Send a note through the organ procurement organization, through the program here. If you hear back, fine. You're one of the top 5%. But if you don't, hopefully get to the other end, and that donor family will appreciate it. So in prayer, you can always say a prayer for that family. And so there are many resources out there. I'm just going to mention one at the top. That oddball name is the name for the Second Chance Heart Transplant Support Group Incorporated.com. That's what S C H T G has to go. If you look up Second Chance in Philadelphia, you'll find this. Everything going on in terms of events like this, movie nights, movie nights the 24th, of the, it's not the 17th, I got that wrong this morning. The 24th, 24th, we do that quarterly. We have speakers every month. You'll find them out there. And these other websites are where the resources are. So we'll move them quickly. Lee Goldberg. So I'm so glad y'all came. We were worried who was going to come. <laughs> we want to hear more about medicine, right, after all you've been doing, right? And uh, so we first have to give a word of thanks. Uh, we were fortunate enough to receive a gift uh, from a donor that helped to support the Heart of Gold Fund, which is a fund that actually helps us to support uh, patient-oriented activities within our program. So they did provide uh, the food for tonight. I convinced the Department of Medicine to donate the space. I know it was like eight blocks, so you all get credit for the parties we had today. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Uh, but we do want to stop and just give thanks to them for helping us to support and make the, the programs kind of as useful, give them a food, and how to make it as social and active as possible. I'm going to talk about um, the kinds of things that happen not to your heart, but to the rest of you after transplant, and why we consider ourselves kind of a holistic transplant program. And that obviously, we're focused very much on your cardiovascular health, but after transplant and the heart settles in, a lot of the issues that come up here has nothing to do with the heart. Really, just the heart's doing great. It's the other stuff um, that gets us into trouble. And how do we as a team kind of address for that, screen for that? What do you need to be doing and looking out for, uh, both your caregivers and you, uh, in terms of helping to deal with that? So you made it through transplant. Now what? So usually the goal is to get to transplant. Everyone kind of hits the finish line, uh, thinking it's over. I finally got to transplant. I survived. I got home. And the irony is, it's just the beginning. It's exchanging the old set of problems that you had when you had advanced heart failure, whether it happened suddenly or over many, many years, for a whole new set of problems that are unique uh, and have their own special challenges. And certainly the skills and the ways that you coped before your transplant are actually important and useful after transplant. They're just different kinds of problems. So one, the immunosuppression medicines that are absolutely necessary to keep that heart healthy increase your risk for certain medical problems. Pre-existing medical problems still exist. So just because you had diabetes before transplant, then you get transplanted, you may have trouble with diabetes after, if you have vascular disease, et cetera, et cetera. Family 
history still matters. So the things that your ancestors had, you can still get, and things that you have may impact your family members. And so beginning to think more globally about how do we protect the health of not only you, but of your family, and kind of knowing what's happening to you, and how do we predict, how do we protect your kids and grandkids so that they don't necessarily need to come to transplant. And then lastly, you're certainly allowed to get the same stuff that everyone else gets. You're allowed to get a cold and pneumonia and break your ankle and do all kinds of other things just because your transplant patient doesn't get you off the hook of good general medical care and being careful and not hurting yourself. So those things are kind of all really important. Now the immunosuppression medicines prevent your immune system from rejecting your heart. And this was what made transplant possible. Prior to 1985 when cyclosporin came along, People survived about a month after transplant, and the headline in Life magazine was the terrible failure of heart transplantation. And even the MGH, where I did my transplant fellowship, the board of trustees forbid the faculty from doing heart transplant because it was unethical, because no one survived. And then in the mid-1980s, the kidney people caught on to say it was born, and voila, we now had a way of modulating or adjusting the immune system to prevent rejection. And this was a wonderful thing. This made it possible. But all wonderful things come with a cost. And the costs are increased risk of infection, which is obvious, but also increased risk of cancers and malignancies that can occur. And so how do we kind of adjust for that risk? And that's really what uh, I'm going to start with focusing on. So the cancer risk, how or why does this happen? Well, immunosuppression medicines make it harder for our natural immune system to find and destroy abnormal cancer cells. And so it increases the chance that a cancer cell that kind of gets loose can begin to multiply. And it increases the chance that if cancer does form, that it can spread. And so we worry a lot about this as transplant docs. So let me give you an example. When we are out in the sun, radiation comes down and hits our skin. Some of those little particles of radiation hit the middle of some of the cells and injure the DNA of the cells. Some of the cells die. Some of the cells don't die. They're injured, and guess what? They can theoretically turn into a cancer cell. Along comes one of these little white cells in your body, and it says, oh, that cell's not right. Gobbles it up. No skin cancer forms. Now, in a transplant patient, you have the same risk of being out in the sun. The sun hits your skin. Cancer cell forms. But the problem here is that the immune system is a little less likely. Maybe it's 10% less likely to gobble up that cancer cell. So your risk of then developing a clinical cancer a year or two down the road and shows up on your skin is significantly higher because the cells that defend us against cancers are the same cells that would want to attack that heart are suppressed. And so this is why we kind of get freaked out. It's not that the medicines we're giving you necessarily cause cancer. They inhibit the natural balance of things that God gave us to prevent cancers from forming every day. Now, there are two categories of things that we worry about. One are the lymphomas. This is something that we call PTLD, or post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. And these are probably related directly to the fact that the immune medications are activating or working on the lymph nodes of your body. And if we talk to Dr. Sai and others who spend a lot of time in this area, probably are also triggered by certain viruses. And the good news about these uh, cancers is that although when I was a fellow this was really a big deal and people died of these, now we actually have a whole new class of medications and a way of adjusting the immunosuppression that oftentimes we can melt these away. And so they became, a, they were a huge problem and then with a lot of very interesting research on the cancer side, they become a bump in the road, something that we have to manage but not necessarily something that's fatal. But the typical cancers, the colon, the breast, the prostate, the skin, are still a big deal for our patient population. So what should we do about it? Well, first thing, you want to avoid exposure to, I put stuff, uh, that we know increases the risk of damage to those cells, right, that can then lead to the cancers. So for instance, smoking, both directly and indirectly, when you inhale smoke, you create a couple of hundred cancer cells each time you smoke. Most of the time, your body kill, kills those cancer cells off. That's how you can smoke for 30 years and then get your cancer. If everyone got the cancer the first year, everyone would be dead and no one would smoke. It takes a long time to get it, because eventually one of those cells has got to get away and start to form those tumors. So we want to avoid exposure to that. That's why we're so freaked out in the, in the transplant program about smoking and smoke exposure, because we know that that smoke that's going on is going to unleash a bunch of cancer cells every day, and one of them is going to get biased because the immunosuppression medicines make it harder, so we worry about that. 
And the other thing is we can avoid is science focus. So that's why we freak out about wearing hats and putting on all kinds of sunscreen and being very cautious because we know, again, that those are the things that can, can um, increase your risk. Now, on our side, we work to use the lowest amount of immunosuppression medicine possible so that we get that balance right, and it's not always so easy to do that, but obviously we want to avoid the risk of infection, and at the same time, give enough oomph to the immune system to avoid the development of some of these cancers. So that's kind of what's going on in the background. Now, what about cancer screening? Well, because we know the increased risk of uh, immunosuppression, we follow what's called the high-risk cancer screening guidelines from the American Cancer Society. And these are the guidelines that the Cancer Society puts out, say if there's a family history of colon cancer, or a family history of prostate cancer, perhaps your screening obviously would be more frequent. Well, because we know your immune systems are not normal and your risk is higher, we recommend screening. So we recommend things like colonoscopy every five years. After the age of 50, many of you had a colonoscopy before your transplant, because we actually screen now before, a change that we made about five or six years ago. Uh, for men, we're looking at prostate exams and the PSA, although there's a lot of controversy over the role of PSA right now. You'll hear a lot of things on the internet. Because you guys are high risk, we made the decision that we're going to continue to screen. We may change that as we get more data. This is a moving target and controversial, but that's something. And then for women, mammograms pass in their GYN exam, and the GYN exam including an annual breast exam by a, a professional, as well as routine breast exams uh, by, uh, by you. We also check chest x-rays. We're looking for lymph nodes or any nodules or changes in the lungs. And then every visit, we're actually screening your blood test. So we're looking at your white counts and your white cell counts and how they're distributed and all that, looking for changes. And we're also monitoring the immunosuppression drug levels. And over time, we're lowering those levels after the first year or so down so that we can kind of get by with the lowest levels possible. So those are things that we're working on. And this is the reason why we get an annual chest test. We're going to tell the insurance company we're going to get it a little bit. And it's, again, we're looking for any evidence of lymph nodes or nodules in the chest. Now, what can you do? Well, number one, you need to look at your skin and have anyone who lives with you who gets to see your skin, uh, see if they see anything funny. And if they didn't report that, you can't see your back, and there's lots of stuff you can't see. So you got to make sure that you're reporting any changes and moles and skin and all that kind of stuff. You'll be the most surveillance than we will. If we look at your skin, but we, have, we don't remember what it looked like last time, it doesn't really help us. And you need to be seen by a dermatologist at least annually. And many of the dermatologists, including the ones here, and I go to the same one that many of you go to, take pictures of your parts um, and so that they can compare them over time. And I experienced that. It was an unusual experience, uh, but an important one, uh, so that if there's any change in these lesions, that they can be identified uh, and removed, because easy to scoop it off uh, than to have a problem. And then report any swollen lymph nodes, or blood or urine, or anything else that you kind of notice that's abnormal. Back to the test that we can evaluate that. And then, of course, testicular exam, breast exams, etc., that should be done all the time, monthly, both men and women, just to make sure that nothing is being missed. So those are all important things that you can do and have control of your own health. Now, what about infections? You know, what about the rest? That's the other part of this immunosuppression puzzle. So after the first year, your risk of most infections is not all that different uh, than anyone else. But there are several obvious precautions that need to be taken. Number one, use common sense. If someone is coughing and spewing and you got the grandkids coughing in your face, that's not good. I don't want them coughing on me. You certainly don't want them coughing on you. So use common sense to avoid sick contacts and educate your family and friends. Look, if someone's really sick, maybe they shouldn't come over to the house. Um, and kind of set reasonable goals and be honest with them and say, look, you know, I just don't want to be able to get sick because your resistance is slightly less than someone else's and therefore your risk of catching something will be slightly more than someone else's. It's not outrageous and you can certainly go out in the community and you're all going to get colds and that's, we want you to because it means you're out and living and doing stuff. On the other hand, you don't want to obviously expose yourself unnecessarily. Frequent hand washing and hand sanitizers are awesome. And now, like, you know, you can't go to my kid's school without getting squirted and sprayed on. And kids have to wash on the way in and out. And I have to say that since, in our elementary school, since they did that, you know, we're all sick less. I truly believe they, they put the squirt things, the same things we have in the clinic, in the classrooms. And I swear we'll have fewer colds the last two years since they did that in our kid's school. And they were always bringing something home. So I think that stuff really works. And that's kind of the common sense. Now for the tougher stuff. There are certain foods that no matter what, when our name is suppression, we want you to avoid. So avoiding raw seafood, undercooked meats, um, raw eggs, making sure you're washing your fruits and vegetables. We want you to eat lots of raw fruits and vegetables. They just need to be washed carefully. 
And if you use well water, just to make sure that it is tested periodically to make sure that there are no cysts or any bacteria or anything in the well water, um, all of the municipal water in our region is actually safe for transplantation and is screened for um, cysts and whatnot. So for the most part, our, our municipal water supplies are fine. But every once in a while, well water will be an issue, so making sure you get that tested. Other infections, well, pets can be a problem. So not handling cat litter or waste, we're concerned about toxoplasmosis is actually the concern that we have. Um, and so you can have a cat, uh, but you can't have a litter box. What a good deal that is. So I'm like, gee, I can't do the litter box. Um, so that's not so bad. But you can have the cat. But obviously, if you get bit or, or scratched, um, you need to watch that carefully. Because again, the risk of infection from that um, different bacteria. But again, to watch that. Bird cages is also another weird thing, and that's because birds can actually harbor certain fungal infections that can be dangerous for transplant patients. So not handling bird cages and even having birds in the house sometimes can be an issue because a lot of that stuff flies around, so we warn people about that. And then if you're going to have an unusual pet, like a snake, a turtle, or a lizard, um, the transplant patients should use gloves because actually those animals can have bacteria on their skin um, that is more easy for you to contract. So we actually ask you to be careful about that. Now at the bottom, Avoiding demolition, we worry a lot about fungal infections for you guys. So tearing out the bathroom, ripping the carpet out of the basement, things that could have gotten wet or moldy. Um, aerosolize, those things come up into the air, can get into your lungs, and cause serious infection. So we do worry a lot about that. And if demolition is going to occur in your home that you want to remodel, by all means, you should have a beautiful home. However, you need to take precautions and maybe be out of the house for a day or two while the demolition part of the work is being done um, so that you're safe in the house. Um, and then also avoiding excavation. So you can garden after the first year for most patients if you're wearing gloves. In case we'll recommend wearing a mask so that you don't kind of inhale a lot of spores from the ground. But if you're going to put it in a driveway or put in a swimming pool and there's going to be a lot of backhoeing going on, you want to stay away from that kind of stuff. Because again, that is a lot of, of the fungal spores kind of being um, blown up in the air. It doesn't last long, a few hours. But you want to stay away from that. And then lastly, you can swim after we kind of clear you once your wounds are clear and all that. But we do want you to avoid swimming in like a pond, freshwater pond. So the ocean is okay, and a swimming pool is okay, but ponds actually can have certain parasites and whatnot that are potentially more problematic for you guys. And so avoiding that is also kind of one of the precautions that we think about from an infection standpoint. What about immunizations? Everyone loves coming in to get their shots, right? My kids are like, I'm not going to the doctor. Not because they don't like the doctor, they don't like the shots. Like, we kind of drill down to what they're afraid of. Um, so if we tell them you don't have to get shots, then they're happy to go. Same for you guys. Um, we do give a pneumococcal vaccination every five years. We also give an influenza vaccination annually. There is one new recommendation from the CDC that I should have put on the slide, and that is that your household contacts, starting last year, the CDC recommended that all household contacts of a high-risk patient should also get an influenza shot. So anyone that comes to your house regularly should get a flu shot, and that's any child six months, year, six months or older, anyone up to 150 years old. Every human is supposed to get an influenza shot, except for the first six months after transplant when you're immunosuppressed and a baby under six months old. Everyone else should get a flu shot. And if they're coming in your house regularly, that's their, that's their gift to you, is protecting you with their flu shot. Remember that after 1972, we took the live virus out of the shot, so no one gets the flu from the flu shot, despite my grandmother's thoughts about this. Um, she went to her grave believing that if you got the flu shot, you get that's no longer true. It hasn't been true for decades. Um, and it is safe. There is one caveat, and that is that the nasal flu vaccine contains live virus, and we're giving that to kids who squirt it up their noses. That is not for you guys. You need to stay away from the live viruses. And if you work in an environment where there are a lot of kids where they may have gotten the nasal flu, you have to stay away from those kids for about 48 hours after they get it, because it drips out of their nose and gets on in, it's no good. Um, but regular flu shots to everyone, and I would recommend that even the kids get the flu shot and not the nasal flu for you, unless they live in California and are coming to visit you in a few weeks. Then they can get whatever they want, as long as you're not around them for about 48 hours. Tetanus shot every 10 years, and we've actually added that to our instructions on our annual form when we print them out at the end of your office visit, and we're sending that information back to your clinic. We don't stock tetanus in our office, we do stock the influenza and the pneumovax when they're in the purpose season. We always have pneumovax. Uh, but the tetanus we don't stop, um, so that you do have to get from your primary care now. And then there are some pediatric vaccines that kids will get, like polio, <coughs> that are live viruses, and we want you guys to avoid those things. It's usually not a big deal, um, but again, if you have any questions to call, we usually call one of our IP colleagues to make sure that those things are safe. But 
these are things that will protect you. A very fascinating thing happened in Philadelphia this year with flu that I just want to pass on because I think it's an interesting uh, exercise. So remember, last year, the CDC recommended that we immunize everybody. And they made the flu shots available in all kinds of pharmacies. And most states allowed pharmacists to administer them now. It was like that in some states. Now almost all the states let just like the CVS, you can run in and get a flu shot. And our the health department in my county, like it was a drive-through, like we drove up and they could stuck your arm out. I got one here, but the rest of the family did. The kids were screaming in the back seat, the woman dove in and got on. <laughs> <laughs> Now they were like, where are we going? And then we're like, just going for a Sorry, Marty. Roll up your sleeves. Uh, uh, one of the things to note is that the CDC broadly expanded the indications for flu shot. They did this a few years ago, but then there was a shortage. Then we had H1N1 as a separate. And it never really got started. Last year, we finally got it right. There was tons of flu vaccine and a million places to get it. And your insurance, because of our new health care law, was required to cover. So suddenly, it, there was no, like, what's your excuse? I'm afraid of a shot, I don't want to get sick, that garbage. But there was no other barrier to prevent people. How many cases of flu were seen at Huff this year? <coughs> yeah. We had one case of flu in our hospital. Yeah. Unbelievable. I've never seen anything like this, and the ID people were talking about it. We typically have several hundred cases every year at this time. One case of flu swab positive, because nobody's going to pick something up here, knows every time we come. Um, one case of flu. I've never seen that before. I think it's because we actually went out. Now, the other thing that helped us was last year's flu virus and this year's flu virus is very similar. So people that got immunized last year were partially immune this year because the flu vaccine kind of wanes. And if you got two shots, well, actually, this year you got a nice booster. So we were the, the flu vaccine matched the flu in the community really well. So probably other reasons. But how amazing is that? How effective a public health strategy? People die from flu. Kids, people lose work. It's awful. And we saw one case. So that's just my testimonial that not only you, but anyone that comes in contact with you should get flu. And you shouldn't take no for an answer. Tell them, don't get babies getting flu shot. Now, pre-existing conditions still exist, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Medical problems that you had before transplant typically are present afterwards, so you're not kind of off the hook. And sometimes the meds that we use to treat and prevent rejection in transplant heart actually make those medical problems worse or flare them up, things like gout and diabetes and whatnot. We kind of sometimes stir those things up after transplant, and we recognize that. And then there are other conditions, and these other conditions sometimes influence how we manage you, and oftentimes may change what we do for screening or other meds that we use. So your other medical conditions actually do kind of tweak it, and that's why each of you are pretty individual. You may be on similar immunosuppression meds, but the rest of the meds oftentimes are very different, and that's because we're kind of addressing the other medical problems that come along. So I just want to highlight a couple. One is diabetes, which certainly can be present before transplant, but we do know that over 70% of you will have trouble with blood sugars after transplant. A lot of that has to do with the steroids or the prednisone that we gave you early after transplant, um, which make your bodies more resistant to insulin. So your bodies are making insulin, but the steroid is kind of blocking its ability to kind of work well in the cells. And as we come down on the dose of prednisone, the sensitivity of the insulin comes up, but sometimes it's not enough, and the diabetes kind of persists indefinitely. Sometimes we can get rid of the diabetes as we come down off the steroids. Weight gain also makes your body more resistant to insulin, and of course the steroids help you gain weight, you guys know that. So the one-two punch is diabetes is a pretty common problem for us. About seven years ago, we made the decision as a program to begin, because we were not doing a great job managing the diabetes day to day, to incorporate diabetes experts either here at Penn or out in the community and really try to engage a diabetes expert to help us manage the diabetes and make sure you're getting all the screening that you want. Because this turns out to be critical. Following your hemoglobin A1C and trying to get those levels at least under eight, if even seven and a half if possible. And then making sure that the annual foot exams and eye exams are being done by the diabetes experts and that they're managing your diabetes very carefully because you have a heart that works great, but if you develop an feet or gastroparesis or blindness, it's a horrible thing. And it's something potentially preventable. So we have to kind of gotten nuts about trying to get everyone to be a diabetes expert. Because there are people that don't know how to do this well. Nursing, nurses, nurse practitioners, diabetes educators, and physicians whose job it is to do diabetes. And although we know the general stuff to do, um, it's not what we do full time. So we have kind of pushed people to go and get diabetes expertise. And the other thing I want to talk about is just vascular disease. 
Many of you had heart attacks and blockages in your coronaries that led to damaged heart muscle and ultimately the need for transplant. That's certainly not true of everybody. But we do know that vascular disease that affects the heart can also affect the, the arteries in the neck, the arteries in the belly, and the arteries in the leg. And so we do do some screening for that. And certainly if you develop pain or cramping in your legs when walking, the medical symptom is called claudication. Um, or you develop foot or skin ulcers on your feet. These are things that tell us that the circulation is in trouble. And we are fortunate to have an unbelievable vascular medicine surgery department. And they can send things and do things and new techniques that we didn't even have five or six years ago to fix some of these problems, just like we have new stents for the heart. They have new stents. We can now repair aneurysms in the belly and in the chest with a stent graft. So they don't even know if they just think you go home the next day. It's unbelievable surgeries people in the hospital three weeks, and now they go home. So lots of things to do. Uh, but, you know, just because we've replaced the heart arteries doesn't mean that the rest of the arteries of your body are not at risk. So we continue to screen for those things and remember those things uh, as we're kind of taking care of you. And then high cholesterol, just one note, all transplant patients are on a statin medication to reduce the risk of coronary disease in the transplanted heart and also to reduce the risk of rejection. So our colleagues at UCLA, Dr. Patricia Gowan and colleagues, did a clinical trial where they put people on a statin regardless of their cholesterol after transplant. And the people that got the statin had fewer rejections and fewer blockages in their arteries regardless of their cholesterol. And it turns out that these medicines act as anti-inflammatories and prevent inflammation of the immune system of the transplanted heart, which is good. So it kind of works with the tacrolimus or the cyclosporin, the cell, the and prednisone to prevent rejection. In response to that, I want to say about 10 years ago now, our program added a statin, one of the statin medications, so medication like protostatin and torvastatin, uh, et cetera, to our regimen for everybody. So everyone's on a low dose for the most part, unless there's a good reason not to do it. And then those with elevated cholesterol, we then adjust the dose upward to get to a goal. So the goal for everyone in this room for LDL, the bad cholesterol, is 100 or less. And anyone who's had coronary disease before their transplant or has no vascular disease, we actually push it down uh, to the, the guidelines by the NCP, which says a goal of LDL cholesterol of less than 70, which is a very aggressive goal and is new for us. Um, and we are watching pretty carefully to make sure people are not getting muscle tenderness and other side effects from the statin medications. But nonetheless, this is an issue for you guys. And even if you didn't have high cholesterol before, most people will be on a statin medication. High blood pressure is actually the most common problem after transplant. Over 70, probably 80% of people get some elevation in their blood pressure. Some of this is side effects of the cyclosporin and tacrolimus and their impact on their kidneys. Some of it's that as we get older, our blood pressures tend to go up, so because you guys are going to live so long, we're eventually going to have to deal with hypertension. Uh, and we also know that weight gain, as people gain weight on the steroids, that their blood pressure tends to creep upward, or weight loss actually will bring that down. And this increases the risk of kidney disease, stroke, and other vascular disease. So we're pretty aggressive about putting people often on one or more medications to kind of get that blood pressure under good control, mostly to prevent not symptoms now, but down the road, problems with the kidneys and whatnot. So we do kind of try to stay on top of the blood pressure. We check that every day. Then osteoporosis. You know, weak bones can fracture. So we can have someone with an awesome heart, awesome lungs, but if they have a compression fracture in their back, it can be unbelievably painful. Um, and that can really be very disabling and, and miserable. And we know that the steroid medications can increase this risk. We also know that long-term inactivity, so if you were laid up for a long time before your transplant, you lose a lot of calcium from your bones lying around. Um, and we know that exercise definitely helps. We also have very specific medications that can control for osteoporosis and kind of even repair or build bone over time. And we do a DEXA scan, which is a form of a nuclear scan, to assess the bones Usually once before transplant during the eval, if you're at risk, the fairer your skin, actually, the more higher risk that you are. And then we also do a, um, usually a DEXA scan a couple years after transplant, if you're in that high risk group, to make sure um, that we know that your bones are okay and we don't have to more aggressively address that. Um, and interestingly, we made a change to our steroid protocol gosh, eight or nine years ago now. Um, and we actually changed the dose of initial dose of steroid you get based on your body weight so that we adjusted it so that um, smaller, especially smaller thin women who are at very high risk of osteoporosis are getting less steroids than a huge gap set. And interestingly, the number of fractures that we saw has dramatically gone down over the years. So we, we made a change to our steroid protocol that influenced that, and we're seeing fewer fractures, but it doesn't mean that you're not at risk. So this is something that we go back and look at at our retreats every year, a couple times a year, where we pick a topic, and we look at the outcomes of a whole program. And we say, are we doing something good or bad? What are our colleagues doing across the world, et cetera? 
And just so you know, the big international meeting is in Czechoslovakia, is in Prague in a couple weeks, and several of us will be going there, presenting some of our results, but also listening to what everyone else is doing. And then we usually have a retreat in June after we kind of collate all of that information and decide should we make changes to what we're doing here based on what we hear our colleagues are doing from around the world, actually. We're getting information from Israel, we're getting information from Europe, information from all of North America, the Canadians, et cetera. Some people are doing stuff maybe better than us. Oftentimes we feel like, well, what we're doing is better than what they're reporting. But nonetheless, it's kind of this ongoing exchange. The next topic, and kind of the second to last one, is that family history still matters. So if you have a family history for certain conditions, say you had a grandmother that had breast cancer or an uncle that had colon cancer, this may impact our recommendations for screening for you because we, you already have a genetic or family risk for some of these diseases, and now we've kind of ticked it up a notch by giving you immunosuppression. So we still care about family history. So if something changes in your family, you know, we oftentimes don't remember to always ask that all the time, but letting us know that so that we can try to incorporate that into our decision making about what we recommend screening for you or to justify the screening if we have to with your insurance, that's very helpful. And then your history of needing a transplant may actually impact others in their family. So for instance, should the kids and grandkids now be screened for cholesterol? Over the past 10 years, we've learned a lot about treating kids at a younger age when they're adolescents to prevent heart attacks and strokes when they get into their 40s, 50s, and 60s. And so it really matters now that you know your history and you're sharing that with your family because it may impact what the pediatrician does with your grandkids. And so we really do want to also say that it's not only how your family impacts you, but what we've learned about you, how that can impact your family. And this is something new. 10 or 15 years ago, we never talked about the impact on the grandkids. And now it's an entire focus of us passing that information forward, understanding what, how your risk may impact them, so that perhaps they won't even develop some of these problems as they get older, as we get better medications and better approaches, as we screen them, we've echoes, and all kinds of things. Um, so again, we are screening for those things, and I want that family issue to be kind of a two-way street. The information from your family coming to you, and then from you out to your family. That's the best you can. You can still get the stuff that everyone else gets. So just because you got a transplant does not mean you can't get something else. So you're still allowed to have cavities and root canals and all that kind of stuff. So good dental care is important. And interestingly, we do have that in our annual instructions to all of you every year that you get printed out at the end of your visit. Uh, but there was an interesting paper recently talking about dental care and transplant patients. When people were on cyclosporin, and some of you saying it beyond that, um, you know, the gums sometimes can kind of get thickened or we call that hypertrophy and can impact the teeth and it was a big deal. And there was actually a huge European trial looking at this. And of course, they provide dental care in their health, their national health programs, so people have access to the dentist. And there was a lot of interesting dental issues, and people got a lot of problems with that. And so kind of refocusing on us that, you know, are we emphasizing that or not? And then eye care. Most of you experience a change in your vision early after transplant. We gave you like 4 billion milligrams of prednisone, and we actually changed the fluid in your eye and changed the shape, and you could, suddenly you can read. Now you can't read. Now you can see. You can't see. And your glasses are being changed. So eye care is important. Just remember that you're at slightly higher risk of developing cataracts when you're on immunosuppression medicine, and those can easily be taken care of. Don't suffer with that. It's a simple surgery. We usually can improve it. It's not a big deal. But just to make sure that you're going and being seen, because you want to be able to like enjoy the life you got. You got to be able to see those kids, right? Run around and do stuff. So making sure you get that. So I just I put these two things up here because I just want to remind you that you're not off the hook. I know you get a ton of medical care, but I swear to God, we don't know anything about teeth, and we're not so good at eyes either. So you got to go to people that know that stuff and make sure that they're looking at you periodically. Now I'm going to bring it all home by kind of getting a little touchy feeling with you and talking a little bit about the psychosocial and why that's so important. Um, we want you to take care of your whole self. Our team is very focused on taking care of your body and screening for all these horrible things and making sure that you're safe and you're unhealthy over time. But we recognize that you kind of have a mind and a spirit as well, and it's not just the body. And so we want to make sure that we're kind of taking care of the whole of you. Transplant can be pretty traumatic. Many of you went through unbelievable things. Each story in this room is like riveting. You can't make it up. They couldn't make a movie as interesting as what's happened. And obviously you survived and been successful, but it has been and probably taken its toll on you and your family. And we recognize that. Sometimes we're going at 100 miles an hour and it's hard to stop and acknowledge that, but it's there all the time. And so we want to make sure that those impacts, and we're looking at you and your family, that if you have depression or anxiety, number one, these get away and get in the way of enjoying your life. 
And sometimes it has a way of sneaking up on you and hitting you well after the fact, after you've kind of dealt with the, the crisis or the trauma that it can sneak up and get you. And we want you to enjoy your life, so you have a full and very rewarding and rich life. But also, those things can get in the way of taking good care of yourself, of getting to those screening visits, of keeping track of all your medicines, of doing all the things. And so we want to make sure that I'm just putting forth that we are interested in making sure that if you have problems like that, we may not always be the best team to manage that, but we certainly have wonderful resources in our social workers, and we have resources on campus, uh, and resources in the community that we can um, capitalize on. We have each other in our support groups, right, so that you have kind of an informal network of people that can be supportive. But I do want to say that, you know, I'm screening for all kinds of things, but your mental health is also very, very important. So this is my last slide, the recipe for success. Now, we couldn't have planned it better, actually, in the mind, because I started with take your medications. So making sure that you're taking your medications regularly. Report any concerns about your health. If you feel a lump or a bump, there's a change in your skin, you saw blood somewhere that it shouldn't be, let us know that so we can deal with it. The quicker we deal with it, the easier it is to fix. The longer it waits and festers, the more it yep, wears on your mind, the harder it is to fix. Participate actively in your health screening tasks. And I always say you should have a healthcare team of experts. If you got diabetes, who's a diabetes expert? If you got your eye doctor, your dentist, you got us, whoever else that you need. But make sure you got a team of people, make sure we know who they are so we can send notes back and forth to them. Get on my kind medicine so you have access to your chart electronically so you can print out notes, you can look at your meds, you can bring them to the other doctor. You're kind of the navigator of your own healthcare with your caregivers, and so that's key. Avoid high-risk activities, no digging in caves, and messing with bird cages and that kind of stuff. Exercise regularly because your bones, your muscles, and your blood vessels need that as much as your transplanted heart does, and so moving around as much as you can is going to be key. Maintaining a healthy weight, which will make your diabetes, hypertension, those things get better, maybe even get rid of some of your meds. And then lastly, take care of your whole self, and that includes your body, mind, spirit, family, and each other. So thank you so much for coming out. We really appreciate it. And I'm happy to answer any questions. I've left a little time for that. Before we have any questions, let me just point out, we are recording this session. If you'd like to ask a question, you don't want it in the recording, just let us know. My wife, Pam, back there, why don't you introduce yourself? I missed you before. <laughs> Hi, I'm Pam Gleason. I am not a caregiver. I did not know Jim when he had his transplant. We've been married six years. He's been transplanted for 17. Um, however, we met because I am the mother of a deceased um, organ donor. And so some of you I know from the transplant game, some of you I know from the second chance dinner dance, some of you I don't know at all. But on behalf of all donor families who have given the gift of life from their loved ones, I just want to say um, thank you for the good care that you take of yourself and the success of your transplant. That means a lot to donor families when we see successful transplants. So thank you for that. And especially to all of the caregivers in the room, you deserve a special round of applause because you went through hell and back. And um, you don't usually get to say anything about the transplant. The other point, what do we do with that recording? Uh, Transplant Recipients International Organization is the co-sponsor of the multi-organ sporting meetings, of which this is a part. And so we make a DVD program out of this whole event. We distribute it across the country to TRIO chapters, and any TRIO members at large can just call the national office and get one free. So if you're interested in that, there are a number of people I know that point now uh, that we're not able to make it tonight. We're going to make extra copies for them. You have an urgent need after you've heard this for it, let her know and we'll get those names together but that's what it's for so if you're going to ask questions you don't want to be on film please just say so otherwise you've just given permission <laughs> questions really yes actually i have two <coughs> you're going to take an extended vacation or something far away how do you know that there are doctors that can Okay, so that's that's a great question. Let me answer that first. So, you know, where can you... Repeat the question. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. So the question was, if you were going to go on a vacation far away, like to Europe or somewhere else, kind of outside your, you know, your normal natural habitat, how do you know that there are people that can take care of you? Um, so most places that people want to travel, like Western Europe and even part of Eastern Europe, uh, all of North America are perfectly fine. There are transplant programs just about anywhere. Um, the things that we worry about a little bit are, are um, uh, 
uh, going to very exotic places. So certain places in Asia, certain places in Africa, where access to health care or access to your meds got forbid you lost them, we might not be able to get them to you for a little bit. Um, that can be more of a challenge for us. So typically what we ask you to do is if you know you're gonna be taking a trip, is let us know that. We can look up to make sure that we know that there's centers around and they didn't share that information because there's a big directory. Oftentimes you can even find it yourself online, but we can certainly help with that. And then traditionally we actually generate kind of a summary letter that you can carry along with you. And I would recommend you sign up for the MyPen Medicine because if they got internet access, then at least, God forbid, you're in a fluster and you need something, you can print out your med list or problem list and that kind of stuff. So it's available to clinicians that are there. And there's always one of us on call. The MPs are on call, the physicians are on call. So I've answered calls from Canada, this and that, you know if someone needs something, and we certainly can work that out. We want you to live, so you should go. Go and see the things you want to see and do the things you want to do. But you have to also be smart about it. You need to take your meds with you. Take extra meds. God forbid that flight gets canceled, there's a big flood, who knows there's a volcano and you can't get for a week. Who would have thought of that, right? So you want to have extra stuff with you. Keep your meds list with you. Carry those meds with you so that they don't get in there and on your legs. I mean the common sense stuff, right? Make sure your immunizations are up to date because you're going to be contained in an airplane for a while. But then go. Have a good time to see stuff. Do stuff. Send us pictures so we know what happened. Mm -hmm. But it is important, you know, again, just a little bit of common sense. And then the rest of it we can usually work it out. Yeah, go ahead. Pets. Yeah. Specifically dog. Yeah. Can transplant patients have pets? Absolutely. So transplant patients can most definitely have pets. And dogs and cats are fine. Um, fish are great. You know, <laughs> we worry a little bit about birds and funky reptiles and that kind of stuff, but, but dogs and cats are fine. And actually, those animals help us both physically and emotionally, and so they're, they're therapeutic. Yeah. And I do think that for a lot of people, having that dog ensures a certain amount of exercise by definition. Um, that's not such a bad thing. So there's absolutely no problem with that. Now, obviously, if your pet is ill, uh, if there's concern about that, you know, obviously stay away. We don't want you messing with the cat litter. If you like cats, that's a great deal. Um, someone else has to come by and help. Other than that, it's perfectly fine to have cats, and you certainly can interact with animals most of the time. That's not a problem. Yes? Uh, Dr. Goldberg, are there any new uh, tests uh, that have been developed? I know there was a blood test that came along after uh, that is supposed to be a predictor of whether you need. Uh, biopsies or not, but is there anything else that's new that's come along? Um, so the test, so the question was, are there any new tests coming along to kind of help us monitor the status of your heart and, and rejection and whatnot? There is a blood test that is commercially available. Um, the test is called Alamat, and it has been available now, approved by the FDA for about four or five years. And here at Penn, some of you may have had the test because we participated in two clinical trials to kind of understand about the test. And the irony is that some of you helped to develop the test because years ago, we actually developed the technology here at Tom Polo, who some of you know, his laboratory actually developed the first chip test. It was that technology that this company then capitalized on. We published that and then they capitalized and actually made a commercial test out of it. One of the problems with the test early on is in the first six months when we're adjusting your steroid dose, the test is very unreliable, so biopsies are still required. From six months to about three years, the test may actually be pretty accurate, and then beyond that, the number actually tends to go up the farther you out from transplant, so it becomes less useful to us. But of course, your chance of rejecting at that point is also much less. So we've spent a lot of time talking about how would we incorporate the test into our protocols, and we continue to evaluate that and look at things. Right now, the, the government is requiring that if we use a test, that we also do simultaneous echocardiograms and a whole bunch of other testing. And if the test is high, then we're forced to biopsy anyway. And so it ended up being a lot of testing and a lot of cost to do the Alamat testing. And if you have Medicare, the blood can't be drawn on the same day that you have an office visit through some quirk of the way it's billed. And so it became very complex. So we are still actively looking at how we can incorporate, and actually we have worked with um, the Alamat team from the company to say, can we find a way to get blood drawn on campus that can be billed properly, that we can kind of incorporate it into one visit for low risk patients that are somewhere between six months and two years um, to minimize those last four or five, maybe six biopsies that we do. Uh, and we are actively looking at that. So we haven't gone that way. Beyond that, there have been a number of experimental blood tests looking at markers in your blood to see the status of your transplant heart. None of them are clinically available yet, so we're waiting to see. Hopefully over the next couple of years there will be additional markers. And there may even be tweaks 
to the current uh, test that's available commercially uh, at some point in time as, as they've collected more data and you know, as we're tweaking it and you know regulatory wise can they change the test and they have to go back and do another clinical trial so they're still working the details of that app so we may have more stuff and unfortunately it may not impact you guys so much but the next generation of transplant patients it may be very different for them we're still trying to sort that out so we're trying to move the target yes do you think that uh, over the next course of the years anti rejection medications will not be necessary after a few years after after a patient's been on for a few years because of the side effects of the anti rejection medications have are there any studies going on now yeah so right now for patients that were transplanted the way you guys were transplanted um, stopping the immunosuppression medicine still leads to rejection, and we have lots of clinical examples of that. So we know that stopping the medicines is very dangerous um, for you guys. There is now a series of clinical trials that started in Boston, actually, from which we're trained. Jordan Matson is a surgeon that he was very interested in um, creating tolerance to organs. And one of the things that he has done in kidney recipients, we have not seen this done yet in hearts, but he has a number of kidney recipients whom they've given bone marrow from the donor at the same time around the time of the kidney transplant through a complicated protocol and then at so many months after transplant stop the immunosuppression medicines and the immune system does not recognize the organ as foreign um, and they have had four or five successful kidney transplants it has not yet been done in heart the heart's a little bit more immunogenic than the kidney but not much more um, so that's what we've seen work so far, and we'll see if that pans out, if that will be. For you guys, unfortunately, probably not possible, but for the next generation, maybe that's where things are going. Yes. When you were transplanted, they did a bone marrow, was doing a bone marrow thing for heart transplant at mm -hmm. the temple. So yes, the that's correct. What, whatever happened to that study? Yeah, so unfortunately, the bone marrow, they were doing a bone marrow transplant and then high-dose radiation at the time of transplant to knock out your own native bone marrow. And unfortunately, what happened to many of those patients is they ended up being sensitized and they actually had a higher rate of rejection oh, okay. uh, because oh, of that. So a lot of people, yeah, so a lot of people, so in heart, we moved away from that approach. The approach that they're taking now is actually a little bit different in terms of how they're getting that new bone marrow to trick the immune system into thinking it's your own and then not, you know, and not paying attention to that new organ. Don't pay attention to that. <coughs> Um, and so in the in the short term, it's working in kidneys. Now, I can tell you that the last big ISHLT meeting that was in Boston, they actually had two of the patients, because, you know, the studies were done in Boston, the patients lived there. They actually got up, and there was this woman that was, like, you now four years, three or four years, she had three other kidney transplants, a young woman, she's probably in her mid-20s, and she got up, and she was on no immunosuppression medicine for several years. It was truly unbelievable. Now, it was a heart and lung meeting, so we're all like, lots of kidneys. <laughs> but, um, I was sitting in the audience with my notebook, and I got a little chill. And I thought, wow, they because, you know, this didn't work out in heart, and we didn't see very much about this. And all of a sudden, a real live patient walked in the room and said, whoa, we better pay attention. So we haven't seen yet for thoracic organ, but there is talk about liver and kidney, and more to come. So we'll be seeing that. Again, it may not impact you guys so much, because of the, it has to be done at the time of transplant. But we may learn something about tinkering with the immune system from that, that won't be able to use less or something different. I don't know. Um, but we're probably a couple of years away for, for heart or lung transplant. But we'll probably, we'll probably read more about this in the paper for kidneys and livers, I would suspect, in the next year or two, because they really are getting going. I think they've learned a lot of valuable lessons in these first few patients, kind of trial and error, about what's working and not working. Can you, can you swim in lakes and rivers? We would rather that you don't swim in lakes and rivers because they are free, uh, they are um, uh, fresh water. Traditionally, I can say that um, because water flows through the lakes and the rivers, the risk is less than a pond, um, but it's still a higher risk than the ocean or a swimming pond. So we traditionally say stay away from fresh water as like a general rule of thumb. The risk is actually lower in the river because things are flowing. And so you don't get as much bacteria, you don't get as much parasites and molds that grow. But in water that sits in a pond, you get a lot of organs. It's really cool. My kids, every year I have to go to the pond and scoop something out, you know, for their biology class. And then they look on my and see 50 billion things, and think, oh, yeah. You know, that's what's, in, that's what's in fresh water. In water that's moving, it's lower risk. It's probably slightly higher risk than ocean or, um, or swimming pool where, you know, you're chlorinating the water and circulating. 
Yeah. If you get a dual organ transplant, liver and heart, there's less of chance of rejection. Is that correct? Yes. So it turns out the question was if, if you have more than one organ. So if you have a liver and a heart, or a heart and a kidney, or a heart and lung, um, is there less chance of rejection? Um, that's a complicated question, but the, the true answer is the liver itself is an immune organ, uh, and it helps to regulate your immune system a little bit because think about its position in the body. It sits in your belly, and everything that you eat goes into your gut. Lots of antigens and bacteria and all kinds of stuff that's in there, right? All that blood has to pass through the liver after it comes from your gut, and then goes out into your heart and the rest of your body. So over time, your liver has developed this really complicated immune system that kind of deals with a whole bunch of stuff you don't even have to worry about. It. The liver's like, I got you. Mm -hmm. But when you transplant the liver, one of the things that the liver does is it's like, you know, there's all these foreign white cells circulating around. Meanwhile, those are yours. The liver is the foreign thing. But the liver like has an attitude. And so it's like, you know what? These are foreign white cells. And so it's like, what are they doing here? So it actually shuts them down. There's a cells called Kupfer cells in the, in the liver that are responsible for modulating the immune system. And so the liver itself downregulates the immune system. Hence, your liver colleagues sometimes can get off their meds or maybe on one med, and we're all jealous of them. But it's because the liver itself acts as an immunosuppressant itself. And so people can get away with that. Hearts and lungs and kidneys, not so much. However, when you get a heart and a liver, because the liver acts as an immune modulating uh, agent, it actually reduces the chance of rejecting the heart. And when we look at the handful, not many, but the handful of heart and livers that have been done, the rejection rates in the heart are lower than the average of the general population. So that is true. It's similarly true for the kidney, although the mechanism is not clear. So if you got a heart kidney and it came from the same donor, it appears that the risk of rejection of the heart is actually lower because the liver is, uh, the kidney is busy kind of confusing the immune system and actually people who reject the kidney before they reject the heart. Now heart lungs are interesting. The lungs can still reject. So the, the outcome of heart lungs follows the outcome of the lung. But the heart is like a total innocent bystander. The lung is so big, has so many blood vessels, miles of blood vessels circulating in that lung, and the heart's just in the middle. And so it's all about the lungs. So interestingly, those of you that had hard lungs, you know all of the immunosuppression is managed. It's one of the few times we let go of something is managed by the lung team. Because it's all about them and what they need to do to protect their organ. Whatever they do is plenty for me. They get more immunosuppression than most people need. And the lung, if anything's going to happen, it happens to the lungs. And the dual organ story is actually very interesting. The problem with dual organs that we have, and this is an issue, it's a political issue in terms of how we allocate organs fairly, people getting two and other people waiting. But the other thing is, is the surgeries are very complex. So most of the risk of dual organ transplant is actually in the operating room in the first couple of weeks after. Most people, if they make it through that, their long-term outcomes are actually better than any of their organs individually would have been. But they accept a huge upfront risk. So it's getting through a heart liver is a big surgery. Heart kidneys are big surgeries and complications can occur. So we try to weigh all of those things as best as we can. Um, but you are right. If you get a heart and liver, your risk of heart rejection is actually lower. Same as for kidney and same as for heart lung. Yes. <coughs> Tachyonomous level, uh, what is ideally a, an ideal range? Um, so the question is, what, what's the ideal range for TAC level? And the answer is, it depends. So if you're in the first year after transplant, we tend to run higher levels. So in our program, maybe 10 to 12 we might be shooting for, sometimes 8 to 12. Um, after the first year, we tend to lower the levels, 8 to 10, and then beyond that, 5 to 8. But those are very general numbers. And we actually do tailor the goals for the immunosuppression levels based on what's going on with your kidneys, whether you've ever rejected, how many other anti-rejection meds that you're on. So if you're on three, we might lower the level. If you've had kidney trouble, we might add a little on that and lower the level. It's a little bit of art, I have to admit. There's not great guidelines, and we tailor our approach to the individual person, but those are kind of general ranges. Um, and again, if you've rejected a lot and had a lot of trouble, we may actually run a higher level long term because uh, we want to prevent that from happening. If you haven't, we actually may get a level around five or six and be perfectly happy with that after the first year. And for us, that's a big win. You're not rejecting, and at that low level, your risk of some of the complications is much less. So if we can get to those levels, we'd love to, but we can't for everybody. And so we kind of tailor that a little bit over time. What's the most rejection you ever saw a patient have? 
10 or 15. Um, yeah, we've had people have, unfortunately, yeah, 10 or 15 rejections. Um, it's not that uncommon. Um, I can say that you know, when people reject like that, we certainly escalate our therapies to kind of more and more aggressive therapies to try and salvage that organ and prevent ongoing rejection going forward. So certainly that can happen. Uh, and we've been fortunate, it's unusual if someone's compliant with their medicine, it's unusual for us to lose anyone from rejection. Because we usually, we're fortunate in that, especially here at Penn, when we have experts in a lot of different areas that we can call, so we can do photophoresis, uh, we can do body radiation, uh, we can use some special forms of chemotherapy that can target certain parts of the immune system that are kind of used for cancers, but at lower dose we can use for immunosuppression. Uh, and we're fortunate in that we do have experts in those areas. So there's very few places that I've ever worked where I can pick up the phone and know that I can find an expert to help give me guidance. So they're not a transplant expert, but they know all about radiation. Or they're not a transplant expert, but they know all about chemotherapy. And that really helps us, and that's what I think strengthens at the big centers, having all of that expertise that we can call upon. I had a 20 rejection. Wow. First five years. See that? And you're still going to talk about it. So that's a good testament. Sure. 52 miles. There you go. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's a lot of miles. Yeah, we are. So if, you've never, <laughs> if you've never had, if you've never had a rejection, uh -huh. and you've been out 4, 5, 10, 15 years, how do you know if you are when you're not being biopsied anymore? Right, so the risk of rejection actually goes down after about the first two years, which is why we do kind of standing surveillance biopsies in our program now up to year three. We're looking at when we should stop doing biopsies. We do do an annual echo, so we're actually evaluating the heart in that way. But most people, if they're going to have a problem, will have some symptoms. So for instance, one of the things that we're going to start educating about is you know, encouraging people to exercise, but to actually do some form of physical activity that's predictable. So I walk a mile twice a week, or I sit on my stationary bike for 15 minutes at some level, or my treadmill at some level, or some amount of physical activity. Because if all of a sudden you can't do that same amount of physical activity that you've been able to do routinely, it's kind of the canary in the mind. It says, uh-oh, something changed. And you may notice it first, in that exercise before you would notice it say in your daily activity. So usually it's symptoms of shortness of breath and fatigue and whatnot. Sometimes there's no symptoms at all. We get an echo and yikes, something's not right and then we have to kind of go through what could be causing a change in your breath function. Is it projection? Is it an antibody problem? Is it a problem with the coronary arteries? And what's the trouble? Um, we actually did, um, at one of our retreats, it's, it's interesting that you raise this. So when we went to the ISHL team meeting about six or seven years ago, we learned that our European colleagues were stopping biopsies at year three, year two, and the Germans were stopping actually after just a few months after transplant. Some programs stopping at one year. Of course, we were biopsying forever. We never stopped. And that made no sense, right? It made no sense to us. So we looked at their outcomes and we looked at our outcomes and they were pretty similar. So we said, well, we're doing all the biopsies and the same thing's happening. We should look at this. So we actually, Superzine actually did this work. We pulled our experience with biopsies and we looked at how many rejections did we randomly find in someone who was minding their own business, who just showed up for a visit, they felt fine, they came in because we said it's time to come in for your biopsy, not because they were sick. How many rejections did we find out of the blue? There was one out of hundreds and hundreds of biopsies. So we made a decision that year that we would stop biopsy in year five because we were going from forever and it felt funny to go to two or three years. So we went to five and then we analyzed that data at our retreat a year later and said did anything bad happen and the answer was no and then well how many rejections did we see between year three and year five none so we said all right we can stop boxing at year three and now we're looking should we stop boxing at year two so we have actually begun to now if we look at our european colleagues our german colleagues stopped boxing at year one and interestingly, their outcomes have changed. So their mortality rate and their breath failure rate has actually gone up. And the, the program in Vienna, there's a, a famous surgeon in Vienna who's very into immunosuppression. And they use a lot of induction therapy. It's a long, complicated story. And we don't do it that way here, so can you compare the data? Interestingly, their outcomes in the last four years have been worse. And they had stopped biopsying in year one. And so they're actually at ICHLC this year. We're curious to see, have they gone to year two? Because it's, you know, like, where, where's the, where's the guy? Because for years, we look like idiots. And they were doing four biopsies, we're done. Well, we sent them home, back to the wilderness. We don't see them. And we're like, really? Because they come like every week to us. <laughs> <laughs> I sat next to a guy from the clinical clinic on both of us, and then they were kind of picking on me because I spoke up and said, gee, you know, 
help me to understand how you're doing stuff. Because I was thinking, how is our program going to incorporate such a change? It's a major change philosophically. Like, how would we follow you? What would, do they do echoes or what? And they were picking on me. Like, the guys from Europe were picking on me. But then the guy from Clean Pink says, yeah, we do five more boxes of the pen guys. So I thought, sure. <laughs> 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 we were two of the largest programs we would make up, you know, 60 transplants, 120 transplants between the two programs. We had more transplants than all of Austria. So we're like, ah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the cutoffs are experiencing. And this is why, you know, there is a lot of trial and error in transplant. We have to be honest with you that sometimes we go from experience. Because if you think about it, if we only do 2,000 transplants a year, we can't do a clinical trial like we do in coronary disease. 10,000 patients worldwide enrolled. We don't have 10,000 of you to study, to divide into groups. So most of our studies are 50 patients. 30 patients, 150 patients collected over four or five years. So most of the data that we have is actually having you show up to visits. We record the data and we report it anonymously by your donor number back to UNOS and then they collate that data and we look for patterns, population science that we do. But I promise you, as a program director, that we every year we look and evaluate our protocols. There are years that have gone by, there are protocols that have not changed in years, but we have looked at them a few times. And there are other things that we actively debate, people come to fisticuffs and feel very emotional about, and we try to find some rational compromise and we do implement changes over time. And some of you have seen that happen. If you've been with us long enough, you've seen our protocols change. And as you're talking to new transplant patients, what you experience may be very different than what they experience, and that's because we're still learning. And we're trying very hard to understand kind of what the right mix is. Now we are doing, just so you know, as you talk to new patients, we are participating in a large trial sponsored by your federal government, NIH, uh, is sponsoring a series of trials called CTOP. These are um, cardiac transplant network trials. So many, many centers in the U.S., each contributing five to ten patients each, but if you have 30 centers, you can get a large number of patients collected over two years. And we are beginning to look at a number of really important questions, things that we don't really know what the right thing to do, controversial things about antibodies and antibody media rejection. These are not things that happen in the first five years, but things that happen five, 10, and 15 years out. Are there things that we're doing the first year that increase or decrease your risk of problems 15 years from now? See, we never worried about that because no one worried 15 years. We were hoping for five. Now, that's not acceptable, right? So now we're trying to figure out what can we do five, 15, 20. So we enrolled our first patient yesterday in a trial that the horizon is 15 years. How amazing is that? Yes. Just to think about yes. that. The expectation is he's going to live 15 years, and therefore we'll look at the outcomes. And we're going to look at his coronaries, and we're going to do all kinds of stuff. And we're hoping to roll is five to 10 patients. So we are doing some research, and we're hoping to learn from that. Again, those things may not impact you guys directly, because you're beyond that phase of your career, you're beyond that. But just to understand that there are lots of questions, and lots of things we don't know, and we're still trying to figure it out. And so we actively, we're a big enough center that we can participate in these trials, and if they make sense to us, it seems like a question that we want to know, and it seems like a reasonable risk to kind of do the randomization, we have actively participated in those trials. And so, and, and there may even be some CTOP trials for people that have survived a long time so that we can understand how are they different than someone who had trouble early on? And can we learn something from people that are 20 years out? And what did we do to them that was different than someone else? Or is there something biologically different from them that we could develop a drug that we could then apply to someone else? So there's lots and lots of interesting questions. Can I ask a follow-up? Yeah. How has the has the surgery itself how has the surgery itself changed over the last 10 or 15 years, or hasn't it changed at all? The basic transplant surgery has not changed dramatically. There was one change that happened about 10 to 12 years ago, and that is that the surgeons used to connect um, the two. So in your heart, you have a top chamber and a bottom chamber. And what they used to do is they would connect, they would cut the little heart out and leave a big hunk of the top chamber of the heart and sew that on to the new heart. And the reason they did that is because it was really quick and they didn't have great ways of preserving the organ. So the surgeon could go boom, 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 and the heart was in. They didn't have to sew each little pulmonary vein or four pulmonary veins. They just took the whole thing and slapped it on the top. So you ended up with kind of a little piece of your old atrium and, a little, and then the new atrium kind of sitting on top. And when we looked at the echoes, the heart kind of has a funny bump. Um, and we knew that. And that was called the biatrial surgical technique. 
And over time, what we found out when people, when the surgeons did it that way, is that the risk of having arrhythmias in the top ten for atrial fibrillation, atrial tac was a little bit higher because they were putting a lot of stitches in the atrium. And there may have been actually a slightly higher risk of rejection because the old heart tissue and the new heart tissue were touching. Uh, and so people were like, ooh, is that bad? And originally they didn't think it was a problem. Now, interestingly, the risk of rejection was only in the first few months, and then scar tissue formed, and then they were insulated from each other, and then maybe it wasn't a big deal. We also learned that the tricuspid valve, the valve on the right side of the heart, when you change the shape of the top of the heart, it got a little leaky. And this is actually when I first came to Penn, this was one of my research projects, was to look at this. So about 10 or 12 years ago, the surgeons went to a technique called the bicaval approach. And about 90% of our transplants now are done this way. But the surgeons actually remove almost the entire old heart and actually do sew the four pulmonary veins into the new heart, into the holes that were there, and then they sew the, the large veins and the large arteries. So the surgery actually takes slightly longer, but we believe that the anatomy at the end of the surgery is more secure for long term. Um, so most of you that are out 10 or 12 years have a biatrial and here you are, so what difference does it make? Uh, but anyone new most likely had bicable. There's a few exceptions, sometimes for technical reasons. If you had congenital heart disease and the plumbing is flipped around or whatever, it, it takes them so long that it's actually safer and easier just to do the old surgery because they can get in and out. But the vast majority of you will have bicable transplants. That's the only change. The way that we're preserving the organs may start changing. Um, so now we use, it literally comes like in a Rubbermaid, but like a take my lunch in. Um, and we use a solution called Wisconsin solution, which is salt and, and, and various electrolytes to preserve the heart. And it literally comes in a helicopter and ambulance here, and it's very dramatic and exciting, like you see on TV, and comes into the operating room and we put it in. In Europe, um, the, the company has developed a machine that actually acts like it perfuses oxygen and solution through the heart so that it preserves it better. So not just stopping the heart, putting it in ice, and sitting it in like a soup, but actually circulating electrolytes and nutrients to kind of keep, not to keep the heart beating, but to keep the heart better preserved. And they're using it for lungs, and it seems to be working. And I saw it for the first time at the ISFLT in Boston, and we think, we don't know for sure, but in Prague, they're going to present the first data in Europe. The problem they have in Europe is that the countries are far apart and there's lots of issues, so the four-hour transport time is hard for them to get. In the U.S., we're more organized. So the European Union needed to move organs bigger distances, and the Canadians have the same problem. You know, they got like cities on the edge and no one in the middle. So you got a heart in Vancouver, you got to get it to Toronto. Can you do that? Can you use a nationwide approach? Of course, four hours is hard to do that. Could they preserve, could you go 12 hours if you had this little circular thing? So that may be a revolutionary change for us, but we haven't seen it actually work. They only showed animal hearts and they did some lungs, but we haven't actually seen them put a real heart, fly it across the country, wait six hours and throw it in somebody. So, so we don't know, but that may be the next big change. So it won't affect the surgery, but it will affect kind of our transport time and how we can move hearts. And in the US, there's talk about kind of going to a different regional system. This that technology would make that possible. Uh, since we are uh, transplant recipients, can we still be organ donors? Yeah, oftentimes the answer is a great question. For the solid organs, usually not. Uh, but for tissue, for bone, for skin, the answer is sometimes. It kind of depends on what happened to you and the risks that you have. Uh, but sometimes you can be. Uh, oftentimes the solid organs, they won't take. Uh, but the skin and bones and corneas and things like that, potentially yes. So I won't, I won't say no, I'll say kind of no. Uh, but it, it's still possible in some cases. Two questions. Yeah. One, what is a quilty two rejection? Ah, okay. So the pathologists, when they look at your heart muscle, so when, when one of us, like say me, for instance, takes a biopsy out and we put it on a slide, um, they stain it with pink stuff and blue stuff. We call that H and E, hematoxylin and eosin. Eosin is red and hematoxylin is blue. And when we look at the slide under the microscope, it should be mostly pink because the muscle stains pink. The white cells that are, would be necessarily attacking the heart, they stain blue. 
when we see a lot of blue cells, we worry that there's inflammation in the heart. And then if we see those blue cells attacking some of the pink cells, we call that muscle damage, and that gives us the grades of rejection. So one R, there's some blue cells, but they're not doing anything. So that's not really rejection. And then if it's a two R, they're actually doing something. But if it's a three R, they're doing a lot of stuff. So that's what we worry about. In the early days of transplant, one of the things that was noticed is that there could be a collection of these blue cells sitting on the inside surface of the heart. So the blood would normally be here. We take a biopsy, a big hunk of we come down with a biopsy, we tear a piece out, and on the surface of the heart that's facing the blood, there could be a little pimple of these blue cells. It was first noticed in patients that were taking cyclosporin. Um, and these lesions looked like rejection, and people freaked out by this. And they said, oh, they're rejected. Uh, and then they treated them, and it turns out that they didn't have to, that these little pimples on the surface of the blood, uh, on the surface of the heart, uh, were called quilty lesions. Quilties come in two flavors. In a, quilty A, which you asked me about B, but quilty A are lesions that actually sit on the surface of the heart. Um, and they cause no damage. No one knows why they happened. Dr. Quilty said these are of no consequence, and he had the courage to convince the transplant teams actually in the West Coast not to treat the Quilty lesions, and guess what happened? Absolutely nothing. And when they re-biopsy, nothing was there. And so we learned that with cyclosporin, at least, we didn't have to treat the Quilty A's. Now, Quilty B's are a little bit trickier. Quilty B's are when the lesion sits on the surface, but then it can have little fingers, little fingers of these cells can get in there, and they're even allowed to beat the poop out of one cell. So if they kind of are destructive, we call that a destructive quilty, they're actually infiltrating into the muscle, and those are called quilty B lesions, and they make us really anxious. And the junior pathologist will read that as rejection, but a senior pathologist will say, wait a minute, does this lesion start on the surface and then come into the heart? Because if it does, that's a quilty B lesion, and that is not necessarily rejection. Now, you may see rejection elsewhere in the tissue, but the quilty B is not rejection. It requires the pathologist to see the surface of the heart in order to know that it's, if you just catch the middle of it or the way they cut the slide, if it's just that it will look like rejection, and I bet you that we do treat some people that have quilty lesions. Now, when we converted to tacrolimus, the number of quilty lesions went way down. It still happens. But we don't see nearly as many quilties as when I was a fellow. So when I was a fellow, there was no tack. So we had cyclo, that was what you got. If you didn't like it, you got it still. <laughs> and we had tack, it was experimental, it was called FK506. It was the experimental drug. It was actually only being used in liver. And if we begged and pleaded and signed five million pieces of paper, we could get like a compassionate use. And in my experience as a fellow, maybe two patients out of 100 got tacrolimus. Everyone else was on cyclo. And I will tell you that every, I read biopsies for an entire year with one of the senior pathologists as part of my training, and I saw quilties every single week. Now, when I came here, we were still on cycle. We made the conversion attack in 2000. Perfect. Uh, Perfect. Uh, Perfect. Uh, Perfect. Uh, Perfect. Uh, uh, Quilty lesions. Uh, <laughs> so now we see. Uh, we're good. At, uh, security uh, says we're uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not, it's usually not the other Some of you may have been exposed to everolimus because we did a clinical trial in a review called, called the RAD trial, RAD B233, it was a trial with the year at Penn. Um, and that clinical trial actually randomized people to get um, this new drug, everolimus, or to get um, cyclosporin we were using at the time. Um, these two new drugs are interesting. I know Dr. Wall talked about immunosuppression last time, but you know there are three groups of immunosuppressions. One is the calcineurin inhibitors, those are cyclosporin and TAC. 
What are the antiproliferatives that cell set for these thiophrin? And then the last category is steroids, prednisone. So those are the three classes. What's interesting about sumolimus and everolimus is they have some properties of calcium neuron inhibitors, so they act like TAC, and they bind to the same receptor as TAC biologically, but they also act as antiproliferatives. So the advantage of that is that they prevent, um, for instance, inside blood vessels, if you, if you put a stent in, it prevents the stents from squeezing down. Um, so that's good. If you develop vasculopathy, sometimes they'll put people on swollenness to try and prevent the blood vessels from squeezing down. But one of the interesting side effects, there's a number of side effects of these drugs, but one of the interesting side effects is that if you have a surgery, the wound has difficulty knitting itself back together because the serolimus actually prevents the cells from growing to heal the wound. So we used to use serolimus uh, or everolimus just after transplant. Well, that's a dumb idea because you got a big wound and lots of chest tubes and lots of fluid and it didn't work so well. So we don't use those drugs early in transplant. We use them later on if people have problems with the drugs, et cetera, et cetera. So both of those drugs are associated with problems with the wound healing. So if we know that someone's going to have a surgery, then we'll take them off. And you usually have to wait at least, well, it's totally gone at six weeks. It's better at two weeks. So somewhere between two and six weeks before your surgery, we'll try and stop it if we can, switch to something else, have your surgery, and then convert back into the drug once you heal, usually about six or eight weeks after the surgery. It's a weird idiosyncrasy of that particular class of drugs. So it's something that our staff is aware of, and if you put them on, we try to remind people if they're going to have surgeries to, to those meds need to be changed, to let us know that so we can switch you to something else, not just stop it, but switch to something else, and then kind of cycle back to that medication now. More questions? Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, Dr. Goldberg, I don't really have a question, but I would just like to say thank you to the entire team in Heart Failure Cardiac Transplant for the increased quality of life that I've had. I walked from the main entrance to the meeting, I and I didn't Sorry stop and huff and puff and sit down and rest, and that's a victory for me. And as I go through So the bruising has probably a number of different reasons. Um, if you're still on steroids, the prednisone medication can make the blood vessel walls very thin, and the skin uh, gets more thin, and so you tend to, if you bang into anything, you end up with a little bruise underneath the skin. Sometimes the other medications that we have you on, like aspirin uh, and the tacrolimus or the salsa, can influence your platelets a little bit. And so they can make the platelets more slippery, which is a good thing, no blockages, but the bad news is you'll get a bunch of bruises. So most of the bruising they have are medication side effects. Another question, is, if you don't mind. Um, mm -hmm. Drinking and taking rejection medicine, does it affect the medicine at all if you had a glass of wine or a beer or two or something? Yeah, so we ask you to be careful about alcohol with your immunosuppression medicines, mostly because the medications have toxic effects on the, on the liver and the kidney, and alcohol has toxic effects on the, um, on the liver. So we ask you to limit yourself to about two to three drinks per week, um, and, and people to kind of be careful about kind of having a lot of alcohol all at once, because we worry a little bit about kind of interactions with the medications and lots of alcohol. One more question. Yeah. What would happen, what happens if you stop taking your medication? What can you do? Rejections that occur when people stop their medicines are pretty dramatic. Um, and so typically they do okay for a period of time, usually a days to a week or two. But then beyond that, they usually get pretty sick and then they die pretty quickly. Uh, we tend to see kind of acute heart failure and then to the end of the day. And unfortunately, what happens oftentimes is we're called that someone's sick with, say, belly pain in an emergency department. And it, what, what that is is actually that the right heart has actually stopped working well. The pressure is built up in the end. So they're sending them for abdominal CT scans and endoscopies, but what's really going on is an acute rejection. And so we know to be very sensitive, if we get a call from the local ear that someone's having those symptoms, to at least look at the heart. It may be that you have a appendicitis, but we want them to look at the heart because we do worry that those symptoms can really be very atypical. But unfortunately, you know, things can happen pretty quickly. So don't do that. Yeah, 
Uh, yeah. what is the uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you guys can do it out. <laughs> <laughs> How many of I have one the year before my transfer. Uh -huh. I mean, I'm trying to go put it off. But because I'm a part transplant patient, the one thing I would like to know would be better to have it here. And is there anything I have to worry about? Mm -hmm. Boy. Yeah, so that, those are great questions. So, you know, we're kind of possessive of you guys, so we love you to have stuff in system so that we can control the discretion and be available. Um, sometimes it is necessary to have stuff done elsewhere, we recognize that that's possible, and we certainly can work with you for that. The precautions, that, the things that we worry about most for something like an orthopedic surgery is just making sure that you get your immunosuppression around the time of your surgery so that doses aren't held. Like, say you're really nauseous after the anesthesia, not wishing that on you, you can't take your pills by now. We want to be able to administer your medications intravenously, say, for a couple doses until your stomach is settled and you can swallow your pills. There's no reason why you can't have knee surgery. We would do a formal clearance. Most likely we do an echo, we may do some other tests, just make sure you're safe for anesthesia and you're safe for the surgery, and then come up with a plan that we write in a note and we put in the chart, and we make sure that everybody knows, and then when you come in for your surgery, they let us know that you're here or wherever you are, and that we can make sure that you're getting your medicines through that. But other than that, the precautions are the same for anyone having knee surgery, and the risks are not that different for you than they would be for anyone else in the general public. Having a risk of infection slightly higher, other than that, the risk should be about the same, assuming that you get your immunosuppression medicine. And it becomes a quality of life thing. Now you got this great heart, you can go and your knees hurt again. <laughs> so now's a good time to get that fixed, right? Because then you get your life back and you can do stuff. Then I'll hold you accountable for all that exercise, right? <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the, the, the calcineurin inhibitor, so the cyclosporin and the tacrolimus, can be toxic to the kidney over time. And so definitely, that's why we lower the levels over time and we watch that. And there are some people that go on to develop significant kidney disease related to those medicines. And sometimes we switch them, we adjust the doses. Sometimes we add another medicine so we can lower the dose. And so it is true that those two medicines, cyclosporin and tacrolimus, can be toxic to the kidney over time. And we do know that. The Celsep, the prednisone, the azathioprine, um, and even sirolimus and everolimus are less toxic on the kidneys, but they all have their own side effects and their own ability to prevent rejection. So it's the balancing of the evils. That is one of the new side. I'm sorry, go ahead. What if you've been taking off some medication that you say we need? I've been taking off um, cholesterol drugs, yeah. and I've been taking off... Um, um, as a thyroid. Okay. See, the um, so, and blood pressure pills. Right. So, for us, number one, the blood pressure pills may not be necessary. The other medicines, it's a risk benefit. So, we know that on average, it's better to be on a statin medicine. But if your body didn't respond well to the statin medication because of liver abnormalities or muscle issues or other ability, uh, uh, you know, unable to tolerate the meds, right, whatever, whatever the issue was, um, then obviously as a team we have to personalize the approach to you, right, and adjust our medical approach. So I kind of give you the you know, 35,000 foot the kinds of medicines because I wanted to give you a flavor of what things that we think about, what things we screen about, what the long term health issues. Notice I didn't say anything about the heart or rejection, I really focused on everything else. Um, recognizing that not everybody can get those meds for one reason or another. And if you're allergic to something, you know, we have to adjust. So there's a little bit of art and creativity on our side and a little bit of feedback from you guys about what's working and not working to get it right. So we do make changes. And sometimes we put up on one immunosuppressant or two or, or, or novel approaches. We mix and match things that we don't normally do to try to make it work for you. And that sometimes we have to be creative. Try stuff out. Well, that would be on our chemo. Yeah. So, so again, so if there's other other uh, confounders, I would say, then we have to switch things around a little bit uh, in order to kind of balance the risks and benefits of other therapies against the therapies that we use. I have one more question. One more question. One more. Yeah. Out of all the citrus, out of all the citrus fruits, 
how come you're not allowed to have grapefruit? Oh, that's so that easy. Well, so grapefruit has a compound in it that interferes with an enzyme in your liver. It just so happens that that enzyme is the enzyme that metabolizes cyclosporin and tacrolimus. So when you eat grapefruit, you inhibit that enzyme and it actually impacts the levels. So the levels go haywire. And how much of that compound is in a grapefruit? Depends on the grapefruit. How much rain they got? The size of it? Is it the juice? We can, so we can't predict. So it causes the levels, especially of cyclo, but also of tac, to go haywire. And there's a couple of weird drug, drug interactions that are like that too. There are certain drugs that also interfere with that enzyme. But grapefruit is actually one of the things that happens. So we recommend not eating grapefruit because it affects your drug levels. And it's because it influences that one enzyme in your liver. So that's an easy question. And interestingly, was, that, that's been known for a long time. It's from the renal literature. That's like 30 years of data. And grapefruit interacts with actually a bunch of other medicines, um, but they're not, the level in your bloodstream is actually not critical. So it actually also interferes with the stack medicines and some other stuff that go through that same pathway. But because the level of your statin can bounce around your blood, it's not going to kill you. People don't care. But dropping or raising the level of cyclosporin or tacrolimus can make a big difference to you guys. So we don't want to mess with that. So because they're therapeutically narrow drugs, you want to keep in the tight range, we ask you to avoid grapefruit. It's one of those weird, Transplant things that no one in your family understands, but that's fine. <laughs>